stretch its legs, see how it, you know, uh, operates at scale, um, and so this is probably one of the ways that you want to do that. So, uh, I'm just going to start with an intro out of myself. Uh, my name is Robert Lee. Um, yes, some people do call me doctor. It's very embarrassing. It's actually in a field that has nothing to do with ComSci, uh, but people think it has to do with ComSci, so that's fine. Uh, I'm a senior solutions engineer for WP Engine, so a bit like a solutions architect. Uh, background, founded three startups, exited one, I have a PhD in Active Network Theory, which is a field that no one will ever use. Um, I'm a self-professed gym bro, um, I follow the Knicks, which means you should all feel sad for me and feel pity. Um, and I love making WordPress do stupid things, which it does a lot of time. So, um, I'm from WP Engine. It's been around for a while now. Probably something you guys don't know is that, you know, roughly 8% of the known web hits one of our websites, you know, every day. Um, so, we, we have a few sites that we host. Um, we've kind of branched out beyond WordPress hosting. That was one of our core services, but of course, like, everything's becoming very distributed now. So, we also do sort of JavaScript applications. Um, we also do e-commerce as well. Um, right. Cool. What are we going to do today? So we're going to talk about what is load testing, why do you do it, what sort of things you would you expect from it, right? Um, we are going to, well I'm not actually going to pray, I actually did this as a live demo, like to like uh, a WordCamp audience and that's when I actually prayed, but I'll be fine with you guys because you guys feel sorry for me anyway. Um, so we're going to do some demo work later, and then we're going to talk about sort of how to prepare for, for load tests, what you should do before you start a load test, and then we're going to go through some demonstrations. Now originally this was going to be designed for like a classroom setting, um, but please, please feel free to follow along wherever you are, and if this is after the event, you can try to DOS the site that I'm going to show you. Um, I've turned all the security stuff off for now, but it'll probably just block you later, but have fun. Cool. So I'm going to set the scene, right? This is like, keep in mind, my background is in WordPress websites, so it's not like big data applications or anything like nothing weird, right? It's pretty straightforward. But take, take for example, you you use case of you sell shirts, right? Um, these shirts are, you know, you just find some meme online and plaster it on there, and it like it sells, right? And you're going along fine, um, and you think, hey. You know, Black Friday's coming up, right? A few days, I'm gonna buy, like, an emulator. I don't know if you guys have seen, like, Amberdix or anything like that, Neo Mini, so I wanna get one of those. Um, but let's say you decide you wanna get onto Black Friday, right? Because you think, hey, I'll get to sell all of my overstocks, you know, and I'll jump on the publicity bandwagon. Awesome. Um, and then, the day of Black Friday comes around, and 
and one of your shirts is on Beyonce's chest, right? Um, and basically, that's great. Everything starts selling like crazy, right? Bedlam, right? It's awesome. You sell all of your shirts. Everything goes out of stock, even the stuff that's super expensive, the stuff that says I'm expensive and it costs three hundred dollars or something, right? Um, and then this happens, right? And it all goes to hell. Everyone's angry. Cool. So what happened here? Basically, you have created an app with lots of cool features, right? Maybe you have some sort of personalization. Maybe it tracks user data and gives you like a personalized shirt or something like that. You spent a lot of time or a lot of money trying to make it work. Um, and then you decided, hey, I'm going to put it online, put it out to the world, and you're going to stick it on some hosting that works for you at that time, right? It's three bucks. Um, and then you send a shirt to Beyonce and it actually gets traction, which is great, and then your site goes down. So effectively what you did was, and this is the same with creating any sort of application, is you've created some sort of application where you're like, I don't know how many people are going to use this, but this solution looks nice. For example, this road. I don't know how many cars are going to go down it, but this is a nice looking road, right? It has bitumen, it's not dirt, so it's premium, right? But then, this happens. Vanilla. Right? So, it's like not being able to understand like how many cars can go down that road. That's the problem we're running into. What is the solution? Let's do some load testing. Okay, so, why do load testing? Um, so, uh, I'm assuming you guys have done functional testing of some sort before. Let's say you created something and you just test the buttons. You know, test the functions, make sure they work, and they don't work. Um, the thing is, uh, I've obviously worked with quite a lot of applications at very, very large scale, and oftentimes things that you think will work when you like turn them on, they don't work at scale, right? They do unexpected things, right? Bottlenecks come up that you don't account for, you know, things like race conditions and stuff. You're like, I didn't know that was going to happen, right? Um, so functional tests sometimes don't reflect how it's used in real life. Um, the next thing, as I mentioned, code can behave differently on the load, it's super frustrating. So any sort of changes that you might make, you know, to a site which you think will do something, sometimes can not do what you think it'll do, or sometimes can create bugs that you never thought were possible, right? And then you don't know where to look, and it becomes like an issue of like not being able to find highs and lows, right? You turn around, it works. You turn back, it doesn't work. It happens a lot. Um, also, as we all know, Servers, right? We call cloud cloud. It's like some amorphous kind of compute pool, right? But the reality is underneath all of that is some sort of computer somewhere, right? Some sort of hardware somewhere, right? Um, and so like different hardware copes with stresses at different levels. And when you talk about cloud, you're so abstracted, you know, that oftentimes when you reach points of stress, your hardware will behave in ways that you don't expect, right? So for example, you might expect theoretically that it can handle a certain amount of load and it just doesn't, right? You might expect, for example, the storage solution. We're having this problem right now. The storage solution that we're using, it's just basically like persistent disks. So they're like, we have banks and banks and banks of SSDs, right? Because we store lots of stuff, obviously, okay? But right now, the problem we're having is the fact that because we store so much stuff and our index, like our index arrays are so large, it takes a long time for things to be found, right? And so we're actually slowing websites down. We didn't think this would happen. We thought this would be fine because they're super fast. Theoretically, the more chips that you have, the faster read write you have, right? It doesn't work like that. We have another bottleneck, right? So, and then the last thing, you guys haven't come across this yet, but when you get into the real world, I always tell people, um, any technological solution exists within a commercial context, right? Any tool that you create, any application you create, you don't create it when you're in the real world, when you're working in a company, you don't create an application because that's funsies, right? There is some sort of commercial uh, outcome that you're trying to achieve out of it. And so like things like, for example, not being able to load your particular site, not being able to access a particular portal or something like that can create like real monetary and brand equity damage, right? So for example, this is just an example because Black Friday was the example we used before. I think the last one is probably the most pertinent. One minute of downtime <clears throat> on Black Friday costs 4,700 US dollars on average. It's 
One minute. Right. I don't even make that. You know? <coughs> My job sucks. Um, but, <laughs> but, but like, <coughs> you can imagine, it's not hard to imagine you've got 30 minutes of downtime for something. Right? And what does that cost? That costs the company hundreds of thousands, potentially millions. Right? And so now you're like, oh, I made a boo-boo. And for you, it's half out. For them, it's like lots of money. So it's really important to understand the parameters of your application before you go live, especially, and this happens a lot, you know, if you guys are engineers, you go into a company, you guys will be the realists, right? Marketers will turn around and go, we are going to sell this to 70 million people. You go, there's not 70 million people in Australia. They're like, we will still sell it to 70 million people, right? So you have to be able to demonstrate to them, this is why you can't sell it to 70 million people. Please adjust your expectations. So what do you need? <clears throat> cool. There's only two things, right? Load testing is not that difficult. It's just that a lot of people don't think to do it. They're just like, you just chuck stuff at it, right? It's like, yeah, kind of, right? First thing, it's like, you need some tools to execute a load test, and then secondly, you need to be able to measure, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, I presented this in front of a partially non-technical crowd. Maybe you guys have seen these terms before, maybe you haven't, right? But just as a primer, when I refer to a scenario, it's basically a template or a script, right? When you're load testing, you, you can't literally get 10,000 people to hit a site, right? You have to fake them somehow, okay? And so you do that via scripting. That's your scenario. A virtual user or user agent is the simulated users, right? Concurrency, how many things are happening on a site at once, right? Or an application, doesn't matter. It's like what is happening at once, right? Typically, concurrency is also time bound. Okay, so you'll either do per second, per minute, per hour, that sort of thing. It's probably not useful to do less than one second anyway. And then obviously errors, you guys have probably come across those before, 500 errors, 400 errors, that sort of thing, like just, you know, something's gone wrong. Okay, some of those are descriptive and verbose, some of those are not. Uh, last thing, I say YAML here, the file format that holds the scenarios. The reality is like these file formats are just like structured data, right? So. Actually, the one I'm using today is JMX. So, it doesn't matter. <coughs> okay. Um, again, some of the tools you might want to consider for execution. Uh, Taurus. Um, I really like Taurus. It is an open source command line tool. Operates on pretty much anything now that Windows has Windows Subsystem Linux, right? So you can do Linux, Mac, any sort of Unix system. Um, and it creates a visual output as well. So you can see what's happening. A lot of the load test tools, for example, you know, uh, I don't know, Gatling or something like that, will just present like a box or a table, right? Uh, Blaze Meter is a commercial tool, so when you have some money, you might want to use that one. That makes things super easy. It's also pretty. Um, JMeter is a tool that you can help to not only conduct load tests, although it's a bit clunky for that, um, but you can also, it's, it's a really useful tool for, for editing those scenarios that I was talking about. And then lastly, I cheat all the time, because it's better than doing things properly. Um, BlazeMeter Chrome extension is a good way to cheat those user scenarios, okay? So if you have Chrome or your application is accessible via Chrome, BlazeMeter has a tool or an extension which allows you to record mouse clicks, user input, you know, actions on a page, and then it'll convert that into a script file, okay? Which is really cool. It means you don't have to manually write it. It also it also bakes in the timings as well. So like it doesn't like oftentimes user scenarios will have no timing, so it's as if you've done 50 things in like 30 milliseconds, which is not realistic, right? But it bakes in like the amount of time you've done, you've waited before each click, so it'll be like 4,000 milliseconds before you click this or something like that. So there, it's super useful. One thing I will say, if you do use the Chrome extension, this is one thing that I've been able to use with it. When you create user, I'll get into this. Actually, let me talk to you about that in a second. Okay. Um, reaction. So this is you, your measurement tools. Um, we also use Azure now, but I am not Azure. I'm not an Azure specialist in our, um, in, our, in our company, so I don't know what tool they use. But, but for Google and Amazon, we use Stackdrive and CloudWatch. I'm sure you guys have seen those before. Um, other commercial tools you might want to use are New Relic. Um, some uptime and downtime monitoring kind of tools, just really blunt ones. Uh, Freshping, I love Freshping. Right. 
Um, it also measures latency. Uptime robot is a really, uh, really popular one as well. And then also, actually, let me get rid of Pingdom because they got hacked. Um, okay, uh, let me go back actually. Um, and then the last thing, if all else fails, obviously you have your command line tools: htop, Windows, and top, SAR logs, things like that. Cool. So I'm going to get into some warnings because I have to, because otherwise I'd be bad. Do not load test on a production environment. That kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. We actually had someone do that. It was kind of funny. They called us one day. I think it was like my second month on the job. And they were like, my website's not working. And, I, and, and we actually, I think it was like, it was actually on speakerphone. So there was like four of us here. My website's not working. You guys suck. Oh, what happened? I tried to send 5,000 users to it one, in one second, and it didn't work. And I was like, what do you think would happen? <laughs> so don't do that, right? Don't do it on your production environment. Don't do it on a shared environment, okay? So if you're using compute with other people and you're not segregated, that's not a smart idea because everyone will hate you. You may also cause lawsuits. Um, thirdly, don't do this without telling your support, IT support, infosec team, security team, whatever, right? Because you might do something and then they might kick off continuity protocols or something, right? And then it causes lots of hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage internally. Lastly, do not do this on an application or a site that you do not have permission to blast. Because what is that? That's a denial of service attack. Or maybe do it on people you don't like. Um, <laughs> okay. How do you prepare? Okay. So one of the things is like you you actually can do load tests before you do like any sort of major load testing. Keep, keep in mind that a load test, just like, for example, a, a denial of service attack, how you break a system is you need to overcome it. What you're doing is using brute force to try and overcome it. Now, if there is a huge amount of compute resource behind it, you also need to deploy an equally large amount of compute resource to defeat it, right? And so you don't want to ever take a really large load testing scenario lightly, okay? So typically what I would do is I would recommend people make sure if you want to do any load testing, make it small scale, okay? Make sure you complete all the features that you want to complete within sort of a given development cycle. Make sure you're at sort of a major sort of release point before you get to that sort of major release. That's when you want to, when you've got a code lockdown done, that's when you want to do load testing, okay? And then you don't want to do anything after that, right? If someone's like, I just need to do another deploy, it's like, we've just spent $10,000 on a load test, you will not do that. Deciding the type of test, there are multiple types of tests, right? There's not just one type of load test, okay? The most obvious one is a spike test. It's like slam it as hard as you can and then let go, right? See what happens when the production environment fails and then see what happens when it recovers, right? The second one is a stress test. Basically, it's trying, instead of kind of slamming it hard and letting go, you slam it hard and then keep going and see what happens, right? So you want to see how does it fail? How does it attempt to recover from failure? Is it an acceptable user experience while it's recovering from failure, okay? The last one is a soap test, as in you want to put it under load, you don't want to break the environment, right? You want to see how does the application perform when there's lots of people using it, but it's not down, right? Is it a poor user experience? What things operate slowly? What things still operate quickly? That sort of stuff. The other thing, and this is where I use the word UX, right? Creating realistic scenarios. We'll go back to the um, Chrome extension that I was referring to earlier with Blaze Meter. A lot of UX teams will not be able to create the scripts for you. Okay? But they will be able to emulate the user journeys that they experience or they expect to experience on the site. Okay? So you can get them to use that extension to kind of replay that, put in the timings that they expect, okay? and then you can use that as your realistic scenario. You can say that is true to life. Okay? Because oftentimes, as I mentioned before, we'll get scenarios and we'll look at them and you go, 
This person has spent three milliseconds typing out 12 fields. I don't believe that's realistic, right? So you want to make sure that you create these realistic scenarios. You want to get this data not only from the UX team, but also input from marketing teams, from sales teams, from product teams, okay? Some questions you want to ask, because it's amazing, you know, how frequently I find a lot of people don't know what to ask, right? You want to ask, from where and how do users access the application? What do they do on it? How do they arrive? Do they arrive in waves? Do they arrive all at once? Do they arrive at throughout the day? How frequently do they arrive? Now, oftentimes, we ask the question, how many people do you expect to use the application on this given day or on this given, within this given time period? And very frequently, you know, when you ask for quantitative numbers, because the marketing person is like, we're going to sell it to 70 million people, and you go, really, how many do you think will hit the site today? They'll say, I don't know, maybe 20,000, maybe 20 million. And you go, okay, based on your business's goals, what is successful? Everything else after that is great, right? And so you ask them, what is their success metric? Okay, hot tip. And then also, last thing you want to know is how long do they stay on the particular application? Cool. Uh, next thing, you want to determine your KPIs. And the reason why I say KPIs in this way is because a lot of times when I see people trying to develop load test scenarios and trying to measure load tests, they want to get perfect results, right? They're like, how much resource do we need to deploy for a perfect experience for everyone always? And I tell them, this is not possible. What you need to work out is what is an acceptable experience, right? How much deviation from your perfect experience is acceptable, right? So, some things to consider, obviously, response time, error percentage, the comparison between successful and unsuccessful requests, number of requests per second. Um, there is a uh, industry... Um, Kind of scoring heuristic that's used also called Aptex score um, that's unique to each organization so that's something you may want to ask them as well and then last thing uh, remember to start small before scaling up big um, so oftentimes when you start load testing you'll come across errors that you won't expect. I did this a lot when I first started. So you want to do small scale testing to make sure that the things that are broken are not, you know, the things that you're testing with. So does the script work, right? Is it trying to request something that doesn't exist, right? Is the testing platform itself the bottleneck? For example, you're trying to, say, defeat, you know, a, a cloud computing system that may have 32 cores. The system you're using to try and beat it has two, right? That doesn't work. Um, and then also, are there any optimizations that you can make to improve headroom? For example, turning things off before you do any sort of load testing. Um, I'll just put this in here because I like this meme. Um, <laughs> but really what you're trying to find with a load test is what is that tipping point. And the reason why I say tipping point is Within any sort of event, especially if it's like time critical, as in like, it is happening right now, we're in the middle of a flash sale, or something like that, right? Or in the middle of an application launch, right? You want to know where the red line is. So you know if you're getting close to it, you have plans to mitigate for it. If you haven't defined what that red line is, what that tipping point is, you won't know when to start preparing. Okay, so that is kind of the outcome of load testing that you want to get. You do a load test, you're like, this is where we say this is unacceptable. So, if we start to see it go in that direction and it hits this point, do this. Right? That's the point of load testing. Okay, just a couple of things to keep in mind, because a lot of people don't know this. Um, a server is considered under, or some any sort of environment, is considered under load when it's 80% of maximum capacity. Right. So when you're doing any sort of capacity planning in the future, just keep that in mind. Don't try and capacity plan for 100% load, because that's considered you broke yourself. Right. And then, if you're doing any sort of load testing, and you're trying to hit sort of like um, soak, or you know, spike, or you know, um, scale kind of testing profiles, try and test for 120%. Okay, so 20% above, 
Load is considered 20% of load. Okay, under load. Um, this made this is actually Blaze Beard, this output here. Um, what you will see normally, I'm sure you guys have seen this before, with any sort of system, right? It doesn't just like stop normally. There's, there's a point where it starts to queue things, things start to slow down, right? It's trying to handle that extra load. So this is typically the kind of profile you see, right? It'll work linearly and then there'll be diminishing returns and then it'll plateau. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of where you're at maximum concurrent users. Okay. All right, I'm supposed to do stuff at this point. Cool. So I said I would show this. Now, you guys can feel free to literally install them or not. Like I mentioned, I thought this would be a classroom. So if you don't, just you can do this later, okay? Maybe I'll turn off the security stuff for like a week so you guys can try it later, right? So anyways, a couple of things um, you might want to install now. I'll start on the right, because it's pretty straightforward on the right. You want Chrome, because, like I said, Chrome extension is a good hack. Um, you want some sort of text editor. Um, I use Sublime. You can use whatever you want. Um, make sure you have JavaScript, Java installed, because I forgot I didn't install Java on this laptop. Um, and then, the tools that well, I use here, you can use other ones if you want. Um, Apache JMeter, open source, Java based. Like I say, it's a load testing tool, allows you to create scenarios, edit them, and then also conduct those load tests if you want. It's a bit clunky. Um, and then Taurus, and then if you want to sign up for a Blaze Meter account, there's a free one, you can do a little small scale load test with that too. Okay. Alright, I'm supposed to do stuff. Hang on, let me see if I can. Okay. This is like a prompt for me, because last time I did this was like a year ago. Um, so this is the website that I would like to hit, okay? Developer.wp engine development, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, just, it's a link to basically one of the theme frameworks that we, that we sell. So, you know, if you make a website, you can use a the theme. Um, very, very straightforward, there's like a support page, there's some documentation, and then, it leads off into Slack channel, Facebook group, that sort of thing. What I want to do, I have the Blaze Meter, it's tiny, I know, but I have the Blaze Meter extension up here, and when I open that, it's pretty straightforward to use. Um, you just give it a name, whatever you want, okay, and then you press report, okay, and you'll see that little thing come up. It is movable, um, so I know that there's like this support button up here that you can't hit if you don't move it, um, but when you click this, when you click on things, you'll notice that it starts to increment up. And that's basically recording actions on the page as well as the timings for you. Okay? That's kind of cool. Um, so lots of... I actually didn't click into these. So I might as well do it now. Cool. Alright. Moving up and down the page. I want to go to the change log. Awesome. Okay. Let's say that's all that a user does, they bounce off from there. Okay, so this is all you want to test. Um, you press stop. Um, and then you want to, let's open again, and we are going to, because I've already named this something, I'm just going to say change log. I can't type properly without my proper keyboard. Um, the Mac keyboard sucks. Um, so let's save that. Um, as you can see, there are a couple of different options to save in. I'm going to save it as JMeter because that's what I'm using at the moment. Um, you can save it in Selenium. So Selenium is an open source web driver tool. Um, allows you to do, it's kind of similar to like Puppeteer or something like that, where you're able to like simulate, you know, uh, user traffic. You know, like them clicking on things, you know. So, I'm going to save that. Sweet. Exporting. Saved into my downloads folder. Uh, let me just move that onto Someone tell me how to move this onto my desktop. Open 
open up JMeter, and the way that you open up JMeter, well, at least how I do it, is you literally type in JMeter. So let me, if you've already installed it by a command line. Actually, let me ask you guys real quick. Who here uh, regularly uses command line? 40% of the group. 40 and a half percent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, but this is not actually a command line tool, this is a Java tool. So you just need to type it in. So just open terminal, type in JMeter, you're, you're good to go. Um, right, I've actually already opened this elsewhere, so I've just told you how to open it, but I've opened another instance. So this is what it looks like. I've already set this up, okay? But basically what you can do is you can merge in an existing scenario. What is that existing scenario, you say? The one we just worked on. Uh, where is it? Desktop. Here we go. That one. Okay. And one other thing that I also recommend, so this is like really tool specific now, I know, but um, it's a good place to start, um, is to also install a plugin called Custom Threads Group, which you can see here, okay? The default functionality that you get from JMeter, and by thread group I mean like group of virtual users, okay? So this is how you dictate how many users hit a certain scenario at a time. It's, the default functionality is pretty blunt. Like all you can tell it to do is how many users, for how long, and that's about it, okay? But you want to do fancy things. For example, what happens if not everyone hits the application at the same time? Uh, and that's kind of where, that's kind of where the, the custom thread groups comes in. So what happens is when you install that plugin I told you to install, you can add a thing called ultimate <coughs> thread group. Sounds epic. And what you can do then is you can copy that test protocol, the ones that you just created, into that thread group. If it will let. There we go. And I can delete everything else. This is what I mean by a cheat. Yes, don't care. Cool. And then from here, you can set different groups of cohorts of virtual users to do different things. For example, you can, here's one group, here's another group, I want five users to not hit the site for 30 seconds, then take 30 seconds to hit the site, then stay on the site for, I don't know, five minutes, right? And then they all leave within the space of three minutes, something like that, right? And then this one can be like another 15 users. No, not 10,000. I don't have that much compute. Um, and they will hit the site after 45 seconds, take 30 seconds to get there, stay there for about I don't know, two minutes, and then leave in 10 seconds. About 30 seconds. That looks good. Right? So you can create like weird curves and stuff like that. Right? This is where the user, user scenario testing kind of like comes in handy, right? Because you can get this information from your UX team who hopefully have mapped out user journeys that they expect. Sometimes they don't. There's a lot of professional UX teams that I know that don't know what they're doing. So, cool. So now that that's done, um, by the way, you don't have to use this. If you feel like you have superpowers and you would like to do it manually, you can open these files up into any sort of text editor. As I mentioned, this is structured data, so you can basically edit any part of this as you want if you really want to go hard. Okay? Cool. Uh, what do I do next? Let me remind myself. Okay. Ah, I am going to conduct a load test with JVR. Let me split this vertically. See if I can remember this. Okay, JMeter, we're going to use a non-GUI version. Our target file is uh, desktop, what is it? Load testing mats, and this one. Okay. 
Sorry, did I skip anything there? Because I feel like I did. Would it be possible to zoom in on the journal? Sure. Everyone always says that. <laughs> hey. Wait, is that zoomed in enough or you just see Mario? That's fine. No, that's that's good. Thank you. By the way, um, I did save that scenario, just letting you guys know. That's why I'm typing in the, <laughs> the name of it. Uh, and then I want an output file. Uh, what did I call it last time? Test results. Doing stuff. Okay. I don't I honestly don't really care about this, to be honest. Actually, let, let me run it. I'll run it and I'll show you, I'll show you what happens in a sec. Because after this, obviously, you want to be able to output something that you want to share with people, right? For example, your marketing team and say, hey, we did a load test based on what you thought would happen and it blew up the server, we need to be one. Okay? Um, so we'll let that run. The other thing or the other tool that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, let's see. <coughs> I'll open up a, yeah, I'll open up another one there. Oh, I gotta let this run first. Another tool I'll show you guys in a sec is also called is it's called Taurus. So we'll, we'll let this run first. While we are doing that, because we have I think 20 minutes left or something like that. Do you guys have any questions at this point? I feel like I ran through that really quickly. Go. Uh, for data protection, is that more of a software or hardware issue for you? For us? Yeah. Uh, we we use software. We also place that software on sort of our Cloudflare network. It's not our Cloudflare network. We let we partner with Cloudflare, but we have a zone. Um, so yeah, we usually don't use hardware firewalls. Okay. Because they're super easy to defeat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So do you think there's value for deliberately creating unrealistic scenarios which attackers might be using instead of <coughs> natural uh, users? Depends what the end goal of the load test is, right? Say for example in this instance we're doing a load test for let's say a marketing event or something like that. The end goal is not to see how you can how a DDoS attack might occur or break an environment. The what you're trying to test for is, is the environment sufficient to handle the audience that you expect to see, right? So you want to gear, as I mentioned before, you want to gear the testing scenario for the specific event that you're planning for. Now, if you're planning for, let's say you're doing security audits, like we get those a lot too, right? Then you might want to plan, say, a DDoS attack around trying to break the environment based on, you know, trying to create a load that it can't handle, right? And also, you might not even use something like blaze meter or something like that, right? Because as an attacker, I don't care what pages I hit. I just want to hit it, right? And so oftentimes a lot of the usage or kind of the like patterns that I see when someone is like trying to attack a server is like completely nonsensical strings, yeah. right? Attempts to log in with useless passwords, right? Or like just like hitting the login page over and over again, right? Just like unrealistic usage patterns, okay? Now, most firewalls will detect pretty like unsophisticated attacks, right? Kind of like that. But I think this year, more than 50% of attacks were conducted by hands-on keyboard attackers. So oftentimes we see attacks that have never been conducted before. We rely on intelligence based on sort of all the traffic that we see, and most of that traffic, like we'll block like something like eight or nine billion attacks a year, right? Most of those attacks are pretty elementary. They've usually been conducted before. You guys probably know, right? A lot of scripts are sold out there, right? To, to allow people to conduct attacks with very little knowledge, right? But the thing is, if you're selling a script to conduct an attack with very little knowledge, your usage pattern is known, right? And so you conducting that attack, it'll probably get blocked. Right. Uh, uh, unless they're on pretty unsophisticated 
you know, a pretty unsophisticated production environment, right? Um, but if they have any sort of security or protection, they'll probably block it. The most dangerous ones right now are, like I say, hands-on keyboard sort of attacks. And those attacks are usually sophisticated enough that they plan to occur over a long period of time. So a DDoS attack, while it can be disruptive, is not always the most damaging kind of attack. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Last thing I would say is, keep this in mind, let's say you go out into the real world and they're like, talk about security, yes, all right, firewalls and software. 67% of attacks are via um, social engineering. So find the stupidest person in your company and find out the ways that they can get tricked and make sure that everyone knows what they are. Okay? Cool. Hey, this one ended. Sweet. All right. Next one. Okay. Actually, uh, let me see. What does this tell me to do? Yeah, this tells me to do stuff. Um, hmm. Let me see if we can remember how to do this. It might just work. Hey, sweet. So this is the, the tool that I was talking about before called um, Taurus. I'll try and make it bigger. Okay. It's nice and pretty. It'll do stuff in a sec. But while it's doing that, let me see if I can create a report. Actually, here's a report I created earlier. Do I have one? That I'll show you. Do I have one? Okay. So that's the kind of report you get out of it, basically. So if you guys are doing this yourself later, right, you just want to go through kind of these metrics. I don't know, I don't really need to explain it. Like I said, I was hoping this session was us breaking the server. Um, but this is the server, so that's what it's looking like, basically. It's not doing a whole lot, to be honest. Um, do we have any more questions at this point? No? So, yeah. your Low testing there, but like you're only doing your, your computer is the only one sending requests. Correct. I was hoping to have like 50 people sending requests oh, to yeah. it. That's why I was like, we can break the server, uh, but but that may not happen. Like I say, I'll leave this open yeah. for like a week, okay? Um, and I want to see if someone can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that big. It's only four cores. They're very powerful, but like it's only four cores. I will say we have made the site very efficient, so. I want to see how many people can throw stuff at it, basically. So in, in reality, in load testing, you probably have some sort of uh, way to have multiple clients hitting it at once and for you to centrally control that. Actually, you remind me, there's actually more to this, um, there's more to this presentation. My bad. <laughs> okay. So we've gone over the results. Okay, all right. Let's say we've done the load test, we've got the results, okay, and, oh, this is so pretty, I really like this. Um, uh, where are we at? Okay, what do you do now? Obviously, a load test is not the end of the, end of the, I guess, um, process, right? You take those results, you analyze them, basically rinse and repeat whether you can optimize the site to gain sort of more headroom, be able to handle more concurrent requests, um, or you might put in additional protections, you know, if you're trying to do security testing, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to leave this one up. Here is some tools that you guys can try out to do load testing if you want to, right? There's a bunch there that are open source and free, and um, then there are also some that are um, paid as well. K6 is really nice. Um, we also have a white paper as well. Um, and I think that's it. Sorry, did you, was there something else I was supposed to answer with your question? Oh, uh, I suppose just, just how you would um, 
orchestrate a bunch of clients? Yes, right, great question. So, I was doing this with, I was planning to do this with just you guys, but typically the way that it will work is, is if you wanted to do like really, really large scale load testing, you wouldn't try and just get the biggest computer you could do, <coughs> right? So you would do distributed load testing, you'd have a master node, and then you'd have slave nodes. You can do this by distributing JMeter or Taurus across multiple you know, servers if you wanted to. That's a super manual way of doing it. Um, or, like I say, you could use one of these kind of tools. So for example, I know for a fact that Artillery IO does hook into, say, serverless, um, uh, serverless uh, services, I guess. Um, and it allows you to kind of spin up you know, these, these scenarios on thousands of, uh, thousands of ephemeral instances. You know, so you can create that massive kind of load. Does that make sense? Thanks. Cool. Also, some of these will just do it for you. For, that's why I kind of said Blaze Meter. That's a cool tool to, tool to use if you've got money because it means you don't have to do that yourself. They've got thousands of servers all over the world. Also, the other thing you need to keep in mind when you're doing distributed load testing is you need to load test from the locations that you expect your users to come from because you want to take into account their latency as well, public network con congestion, things like that. Okay? All right. I think I'm going to end it there if there's no more questions. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. So thank you so much for allowing me to present here and inviting me. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and you guys can find me here. Sorry, I was super unprepared. <laughs> that's, that's all good. Best presentation that I know the most natural. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for coming. Obviously, you are familiar with the UCS mug. Yes, so what do I do with you. it? Is it um, actually for me? Yes, it is. It's for you for coming out to present to us tonight. So. Aww, I feel yeah. special. I thought there was lots of germs all over this, but it turns out it's just no, my germs. It's, it's, yeah, we, we got it fresh from the box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys.